be aware of the fact that you are being recorded. And uh, everything you say can and will be held against you. <laughs> yes. Let me just turn it over to, uh, to Joanne as chapter two. Okay. okay, Bill, thank you very much. And thank you for everyone who has shown up tonight to hear a really, really great presentation. Now, a couple of us had a little bit of a preview of this particular program. Um, Bill Rizek, from uh, who hangs out with the Connecticut chapter as well, and also several others, had given a presentation at the Rhode Island chapter meeting in November. And uh, his presentation was about Dick Stewart, known as Dr. Strange Glove. Got to say that 10 times. Uh, but Dr. Strange Glove. And many of us may remember back that far. Thank you for holding that up. And many of us can probably remember back. I do remember about Dick Stewart and all the stories that came out about him when he, uh, he spent part of his career here in Boston. Uh, the one thing that I really, really also liked about the presentation that Bill gave at Rhode Island, because it wasn't, it wasn't just about Bill, which a lot of it was. It wasn't just about baseball, but it's also about getting into the mind of a very unusual and unique player. And it was very thought provoking and it brought up a lot of um, uh, sort of questions and, dis and discussions amongst us about just what baseball might do to a certain person. And uh, Bill gave such a great program in regard to all of that, that we immediately decided we're gonna to have to have him do it again. And so we asked Bill if he would be our presenter for today's program that we're having here in January. Uh, and he readily agreed and thank, thank you that he did uh, because I think that everybody's going to enjoy very much what he has to say on this subject. And also we do also encourage you to go out there and buy the book and uh, you will not be disappointed. So if we can bring Bill on and get him started on the story so we won't waste any more time before we hear the whole story. So Bill Reisick, come on board. Thank you, Joanne. Yeah. And thank you for the nice things you said about the Rhode Island presentation. Uh, I'll say it started out by saying Dick Stewart was ahead of his time. He was a lousy fielder, a, a really lousy fielder before they had the DH. He was an egotistical self-promoter when it was considered ghost to be that, as opposed to today with Twitter and all the social media. And he was a high strikeout guy at a time when strikeouts were considered to be a bad thing. Now, Dick Stewart was not a Hall of Famer. He wasn't a great player, one of the all-time greats. What makes him interesting? Well, for one thing, he was a very talented hitter. He was a home run hitter. In 1956, he was the most famous minor league player in America, and he was more famous than a lot of major league players, because that year, Dick hit 66 home runs in Lincoln, Nebraska, and then number 66 became Dick's match for the rest of his life. He took the number 66 with him, and he'd hang him up on the wall every place he lived. He signed his autograph with 66. Uh, he used that 66 constantly, and, then, and two years later, I think it was the next year, he went to spring training as a rookie. And you may remember there were Phillips 66 stations around. And when the bus was driving around Florida with his teammates, he'd say, well, they knew old Dick was coming. They put my sign up. And rookies were not supposed to say those kinds of things. But Dick did. He was an unusual person. He was also known as Dr. Strangelove, a terrible fielder. But he's not the only terrible fielder in baseball. But he was terrible in a unique way. Most, fielder, most people who are accused of being bad fielders either deny they're bad or they vow to get better. He didn't either. He embraced it. He made it his legend. He made jokes about it. Uh, he said fielding was for people who couldn't hit. He said, yeah, I hit so well, I don't need to field. And he was known as Dr. Strange Glove and also known as the Ancient Mariner. Uh, you English majors may realize the title of the Ancient Mariner who stoppeth one in three. That was Dick Stewart. Uh, he, he loved that. He talked about it all the time. Uh, he had an outrageous personality, a lot of which was an act. Uh, Dick was an uneducated guy, uh, not the brightest guy in the world, witty. He was, he was a wit, uh, interesting person, but 
you almost got the impression he was covering up for insecurities by having this larger than life brash personality, always made outrageous statements. And he became famous in 1956 in Lincoln with those 66 home runs. Uh, now hitting over 60 home runs in the minor leagues doesn't necessarily make you famous. Uh, who remembers Moose Claybaugh and Bob Cruz and a few other guys? Uh, but Dick did, because when somebody hits all those home runs, uh, reporters come around to see who this guy is. And when they found Dick, they found a gold mine. Uh, never at a loss for a quote, outrageous braggart, uh, mm -hmm. not modest in the way usually if someone in those days would say, well, do you think you'll break the records? Or, well, God, with God's help. And, you know, I, I hope I can. And I'm so lucky. Uh, they asked him if he was going to break the all-time minor league record. And he said, of course I will. I'll do it easily. He didn't, but that didn't matter. Uh, Dick was different than anybody had come across, and they couldn't write enough about Dick Stewart. He got national attention. Uh, and he, uh, next, year, next year, he ended up in Hollywood. You know, Stewart was the most famous minor leaguer in America in 1956. Uh, he had an article in Life Magazine about him. Now, Life Magazine uh, was covering popes, presidents, kings, not class B first baseman. But Dick Stewart made it. And that's why he was such an unusual character. Uh, he hit long home runs. He hit supposedly a 650 foot home run in Pueblo that stuck in the mud. Whether it went to under 60, 650 feet or not is doubtful, but it was written down. So therefore, it occurred. So after a great season in 56, uh, he was just very full of himself. He was the classic self-centered narcissist, very fastidious about his appearance. He was a tall, good-looking Californian, dressed very uh, stylishly, and was known for spending inordinate amounts of time in front of the clubhouse mirror combing his hair. He and Bo Belinsky tied for the major league record for most time spent in front of the clubhouse mirror. Uh, some of you may remember, may know Larry Gerlach, who was a one of the Sabre legends who's written a lot about umpires. Uh, in 1956, Larry was a teenager growing up in Lincoln, Nebraska. And he told me how he remembered Dick say there's this Cadillac comes screeching into the parking lot of Sherman Field. Dick jumps out. He's got the California clothes. And this is the middle of Nebraska. They weren't the most uh, hip group of people. He's got his ducktail haircut. He's got the big Cadillac. He's got the clothes. And he said, my friend and I were just in awe of him. We, he was our hero from then on which is exactly what Dick wanted. He wanted people to be in awe of him. Uh, Roger Maris hid from people uh, when he was approaching 61 home runs. Stewart would stand out in front of the hotel Cornhusker in Lincoln, hoping people would recognize him and talk to him. He couldn't get enough attention. I just loved it. But after 56, which was in many ways the highlight of Dick's career and life, 57 was a disaster. They sent him to Hollywood after a spring training where he had gotten on Bobby Bragan's nerves, no end. And most major league rookies in those days in spring training would do anything to make the team. Dick didn't seem to care. He wouldn't field. He didn't want to practice. All he wanted to do is hit, swing the bat and talk about how great he was. And he would bend the ears of reporters, much to the annoyance of the veterans. And he just antagonized everyone. Uh, they sent him to Hollywood. And Hollywood was made for Dick Stewart. Uh, he got so much publicity there. If you read the Hollywood papers from the early season, 1957, you'd think Dick was the only guy on the team. Every day there was an article about him and what he said and what he was doing and what everybody said about him. He was just in his glory. He met Jane Mansfield on one of the movie lots. And she said, I'm really jealous. You're getting more publicity than I am. And he said, you're just not hitting the home runs, baby. And that was <laughs> Dick Stewart. He just loved that kind of stuff. But it turned out that Dick... Uh, was over his head. Uh, Hollywood was Pacific Coast League. That was a pretty fast circuit. He was over his head. He struck out a lot. He didn't feel well. He got distracted in the field. He'd be talking to the fans. The ball would get hit and he'd be lost. Uh, and he got sent down to Atlanta. Uh, some people would be chastened by that. Not Dick. He just thought he got a raw deal. Uh, he was going to go back and get called up to the majors and lead the National League in home runs. But he did about the same thing in Atlanta as he did in Hollywood. Struck out a lot, hit a few long home runs, annoyed the manager, made a lot of errors. And they just had it with his attitude because he didn't care. Uh, so they sent him back to Lincoln. 
You know, here's a guy who had 66 home runs in 1956. About 10 months later, he's back in Lincoln. Said, this will show him. But it didn't. Uh, he went did the same kind of stuff that he did there. Harry Dunlap, who was a longtime coach, played with him there. And he told me a story. He said, one day, Dick just was just playing terribly. Botched a couple plays. And then one play, he just missed first base. Just you know, didn't didn't touch the bag. And said, so our manager, who's Larry Shepard, got so mad. I said, I, he jumped up and hit his head on the dugout. And he said, Dunlap, get in there. And he said, anybody else pulled out in the middle of an inning would have been humiliated. He said, I, I had to use Dick's glove. So I didn't have a first baseman's glove. And he flipped me the glove as I was going by him and said, have a great game, Harry. And walked off as if he didn't have a care in the world because that was Dick. Dick could not show that he cared. He finally got his game together. And there was there were so many new Dick Stewarts out there. Every year, if you read the papers, read the sporting news, read the Pittsburgh papers, every year, I'll say, this year there's a new Dick Stewart. He's fielding better, and he would have a few good games, and he's more mature. You know, he's had a he's a father now. He's more mature. There must have every year there was a new Dick Stewart. And in 1958, the new Dick Stewart lasted at least half a season and most of the season. He had 31 home runs in Salt Lake City, and they called him up to Pittsburgh. Uh, Pittsburgh had been an awful team in the early 50s. They were rebuilding a lot of young players. And thanks to a very good second half by Stewart, they finished um, second, which was a, a miracle. Uh, best season in ages. They got a parade. They got everything. But Stewart got shorted on the money. They got money for finishing second. And his teammates did not vote him as much of a share as he really contributed which led to lots of stories about how they didn't like him. And I talked to a lot of his teammates, people like uh, Vern Law, Dick Grote, uh, Bill Vernon, Bob Friend, and two of those have unfortunately have passed away. And they all said, Stuart was a great guy. And I thought, what, what is this? What, they, all the papers said they hated him. They're saying he's a great guy. And it could, said, could have been a couple things. One is, it's been a long time. They don't want to say bad things about someone, particularly when they're dead, to somebody they don't know. But then I, I think the other possibility is probably the more realistic ones. They, they all said the same thing, and they were all so adamant that Dick was a great guy. They all loved him. And I think what happened is when he came up in 1958, he was really obnoxious, and they hated him. And that's when they cut him out of the money. And I think by around 1960, there was somewhat of a new Dick Stewart. He'd mellowed a little. He still had the same braggadocio, but it was more self-deprecating humor. Uh, he he mellowed a little. I think that Dick Stewart they did like. Uh, they always said they, they frustrated them because he didn't work on his fielding. He could annoy them, but he basically was a good guy. And there were a million stories and put a lot in the book, too many to go through here, but they all had their stories about Dick Stewart and his antics and fielding and his joking around. Hmm. So in 1960, the Pirates won the World Series, of course. And Stewart, who was such an egomaniac, couldn't wait to get in the World Series, and he flopped. Had a terrible series. Uh, three hits and 20 at bats, fielded badly. But in game seven, he, if nothing else is the answer to a trivia question, who was on deck when Bill Maskowski hit the home run? And Stewart was there. He was going to redeem himself. Here's a guy who wants to be famous. Mazeroski's up. Mazeroski's not a real home run hitter. And he figures, okay, I've had a lousy series. Now it's all going to come back. Uh, I don't care if Mazeroski gets on or if he makes it out, I'm going to hit a home run and win the game. And Mazeroski didn't give him that chance. Uh, and after the game, he said, uh, Bill, they came to see me hit the home run, not you. Uh, and when they were, his teammates were joshing Mazeroski about his dance around the bases, Stewart said, you should have seen what I had planned. And that was sort of said a lot about Dick Stewart's career, so close to fame. Yeah, and so many times he became close, but he didn't quite get over the top. So he had an all-star season in 61, which was uh, really a good season, batted over 300 and 35 home runs. Lousy season in 62 wound up in Boston, which was a good move for him because he went from Forbes Field, which had left field way out there to the Green Monster, which was a very nice park for a power hitting uh, pole hitter like Dick Stewart. And in Boston, he had two really good seasons, at least at the plate. 63, he hit 42 home runs and led the American League with 118 RBIs. The next year, he had 33 home runs, drove in 114. 
but he didn't make the all-star team either year. And the first year that became a real bone of contention because mm -hmm. even though he finished second player balloting, uh, Ralph Houck, who was the all-star manager, picked Norm Seaburn as the, as the backup. And Norm Seaburn was not having a very good year, certainly not an all-star year. And Stewart was angry. Uh, he wanted to be an all-star. He saw himself as an all-star. In those days, he had a Sunday show, Sunday night show in Boston called Stewart on Sports. And he, he went on the air one time and took a picture of Ralph Houck and ripped it up. Now, that's nothing today with the theater you see on TV. Back in 1963, they didn't do those types of things. You know, Haywood Hale Broon didn't rip up pictures of somebody else on TV. But it became a running joke at banquets. When on, uh, Stewart and Houck would banter with each other. Houck went along with the joke. And one day, Houck showed up with a picture of himself in a metal frame <clears throat> and handed it to Stewart and said, here, you can't, you can't rip this one up. And they, they got a lot of mileage out of that joke. Uh, now, how found Stuart amusing, but how didn't have to watch him try to play first base every day, which Johnny Pesky did. Uh, Pesky, most of us remember Pesky as the, the, this kindly old man, the voice of the, you know, the, the spirit of the Red Sox. But in 1963, Johnny Pesky was a fiery young manager uh, in a tough situation, wanted very badly to win. And there is Dick Stewart at first base, sort of lollygagging around. And he made a few spectacular errors. The Red Sox in 63, so those of you who are, remember, uh, they had a really surprising good start and then just fell apart in August. And Pesky just went crazy. Uh, he wasn't getting along with Yastrzemski. He wasn't getting along with Stewart. And when you're not getting along with your two best hitters, that's not a good thing for a manager. Yastrzemski won the batting title. Stewart won the RBI title. And they both... Uh, we're feuding with Pesky. Uh, and what's interesting, if when they talked to Pesky afterwards, the one he seemed to really not like after that was Yastrzemski, although they reconciled later on. But they'd ask him about Stewart expecting to get a fiery response. He'd say, ah, I like the old joker. You know, I don't know what it is. There's not a mean bone in his body. There was something about Stewart. He was annoying, but people really didn't hate him because he wasn't a mean person. He wasn't vindictive. He was just irresponsible. He was like a big kid. <laughs> Um, you know, Paul Pettit, who played over in Hollywood, said he was like a 12-year-old. said, I don't think he knew who was president of the United States. All he cared about was himself and hitting home runs. Uh, he was a, kind of an innocent guy in a lot of ways. And they got pesky fired. And Stewart got traded. And the Red Sox were so sick of him because he had been such a disruptive influence that they pretty much gave him away to the Phillies for Dennis Bennett who everyone knew had a sore arm and was just about washed up. Uh, and he, that was really the beginning of the end for Stewart. He had one so-so season in Philadelphia and they gave him away to the Mets for three minor leaguers. The Mets released him in the middle of the season and he signed with the Dodgers, made it to the World Series. And for the first time, there really was a new Dick Stewart. When Dick, just when they, that saying, they learn how to say hello when it's time to say goodbye. When Dick's skills started fading, he wasn't a regular player. He became a team player. He did. He started fielding fairly well. He was a, a team man, and he was excited to get to the World Series. But he was at the end of the line. Went to Japan for a couple of years after that. And he, as you can imagine, he did not fit in with the Japanese work ethic. Uh, mm -hmm. That was not Dick's kind of thing. They say they have a saying in Japan that the protruding nail must be hammered down. And Dick Stewart was the protruding nail. He lasted two years, didn't make it through the second, finished up a, part, a couple months with California and then Phoenix, and it was done. Uh, he spent most of his post-baseball life doing not very much. Uh, the last part of the biography is not that long. You can mm. cover Stewart's last 30-something years uh, very quickly. He was very secretive about it. He only said his ex-wives were looking for him. He didn't want anyone to know where he was, and he wouldn't tell people where he was. He'd say, I'm living in the southern, I'm living in the western United States. Uh, you know, he was very secretive, and that possibly he just want, didn't want to admit that nobody was looking for him. Uh, he had never really focused on earning a living after baseball. He just thought he was going to play baseball forever. Uh, he was in the stock brokerage business, but never learned much about it. He just took clients out golfing, which is all he ever did afterwards never really earned a lot of money, had a very nondescript job. He had a shot at the Red Sox broadcasting job when Ken Harrelson was up for it and didn't get it. 
And I, in the book, I compare a Stewart to Ken Harrelson because there are a lot of similarities. Um, same type of player, bad fielder, power hitter, not a great player, but a good player. Uh, real braggarts, uh, womanizers, it's many similar, both baseball's champion arm wrestler. Uh, Harrelson succeeded Stewart. But Harrelson made it in baseball afterwards, and Stewart did not. And Stewart really didn't have the work ethic. He didn't have a work ethic as a player, didn't have it after he was a player. Uh, he had a, a personal life that was active, uh, but not very uh, I don't know, rewarding, fulfilling. He was married very young, had a daughter, got divorced, married a second time, divorced her. Had two more or had two more children divorced her. Or passed away. Uh, the sons were estranged from him. He, he was tell me the story about what he was like on the road, you know, when he sent the kids away. He didn't have much connection with his family. The only thing, when I went looking for family members, I got hold of his brother's wife. Uh, Laurel Stewart, who was really helpful in terms of family background, photos. He gave me a number of photos for the book, which I never would have gotten otherwise. Uh, his brother, Daryl, has dementia and was not able to help. But one of the nice things, and I'm, I'm kind of coming to the end here, and uh, is that when we got, uh, she really helped me out with the book. So when we had a cover for the book, I emailed her a picture of the cover, said she brought it into Daryl at the home he was at. He said it was the most emotion I've seen him have in a long time. He was so mm -hmm. excited to see that there was going to be a book about his brother, which is a nice thing. Mm -hmm. So now to sum up, why write a biography of Dick Stewart? Uh, he wasn't a Hall of Famer. He was, his, his fame was really in being one of the worst fielders in the history of baseball. And, and he had a reputation for being really bad, but now I know a lot more about feeling than statistics than we used to. And he's still really bad. Uh, modern sabermetrics show he's just as bad as he said he was, maybe worse. Uh, and he always had this joke he used. And he used it over and over, changed the names. Whenever, came, whenever he made a, a stop of a hot line drive, he'd say, oh, I must be slowing down. Two years ago, I could have gotten out of the way of that one. And he used that over and over again. But he was an interesting person. Always lots of quotes about Dick Stewart. You can find quotes by him, about him. Anybody you talk to has a million Dick Stewart stories. But I said, in some ways, he was kind of a, a sad person because he didn't seem to have any close friends. He never had a good marriage. Uh, he was always a loner among his teammates. They say what a great guy he was. But afterwards, you know, the, the 60 Pirates were known for being a really close-knit group of people. Uh, he never went out with them. He went off on his own somewhere. Uh, cultivated his own image. And, and he, when he was old, he was kind of alone. Uh, and he, that persona he had created of being the bon vivant, the man about town, uh, was really a creation, his creation. I don't know that it was really him. And I don't know that there was a real Dick Stewart. You know, any biographer wants to say, who was the real Dick Stewart? You know, was there one? I, I don't know. Maybe the image was the real, maybe that was the only Dick Stewart. But in any event, uh, Dick Stewart was entertaining. You know, that's what got me interested in him. I, I got interested in him when I was writing a book on the Mets. And, I, and the more I say about him, I said, boy, this is an interesting guy. You know, he's just, he always had a line. Like when Jim Pesky, uh, after Pesky got fired as a Red Sox manager, he became a coach, first base coach of the Pirates. And Pes and uh, Stewart was playing in the National League. He said, went up to him and said, Johnny, I made you what you are today, a coach. And he had always had those lines. And when, when reporters would call him at home after Pesky got fired, he answered Johnny Pesky's residence. And then he'd tell him how expensive, how much his house cost, and how he had a, it was a private neighborhood, and you had to call on the phone. And it was just an entertaining guy. And I, I found him fascinating. And that's why I wrote a biography about somebody who was a good ball player, a good hitter, an interesting player, and an interesting person. God, that is I thought it was a really fascinating book, uh, Bill. I heard you talk about it in Rhode Island, and then I got the book from you there, and uh, and read it. And it, yeah, it seemed like he was a very sad guy at first. That he was just so compulsive. He just had this need to be valued and appreciated, and couldn't stop talking about himself. 
But the more I read in the book and the more I guess you got to know him and maybe he got to know himself a little bit, um, he was actually pretty funny. He had a lot of quips. He was very self-deprecating, as you said. And uh, I mean, he had a TV mm -hmm. show for a while. One of the things I enjoyed the most about the book is a TV show he had. He would have guests on and they would always throw him something at some point during the uh, during the show. And he, he would, of course, drop it. Uh, just make poking fun at himself for him, him being yeah. a fumbler and so forth. But it was just a, a shtick that that he pulled off and uh, he he was pretty funny, even though it may have been masking something else, as you suggest. Yeah. I've, I've missed a lot of that. I, my screen was frozen, so I'm oh, sorry. not sure what you said, Bill. <laughs> no, it was great. If, if, there was a, if there was a question, if, if you were saying yeah. nice things about the book, thank you very much. If yes, you asked I me was. a question, I have no idea what it was. <laughs> uh, well, can, can I ask a question, uh, Bill? Are you sure. opening up for questions, Bill? Yes. Now one? Go for so, it. So um, I'm really looking forward to getting the book. Um, I actually have two questions, Bill, are. Um, the first is I've, over the years, and I'm sure this is in the book, or I'm guessing it is, I've heard the story about Dick making three putouts in one inning, or wait, no, that's not it. Well, making three, 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 two three, three assists one where in one he made, inning. One where he made three putouts in one inning, got a standing ovation, and the other one where a hot dog wrapper was flying by first base and he grabbed it and he got a standing ovation because it was the first thing that he had caught all day. I'm wondering if either of those are true. The other question is, did you, in searching for the real Dick Stewart, um, did you maybe find anything about his childhood or his relationships with his parents or children or wives that maybe gave you some, a limb being a lousy husband, that maybe gave you some introspection? Thanks. Well, those stories were repeated a million times. I, I, I've heard it so many times. A hot dog wrapper story is true. And he actually got he had record for setting three assists in one inning as a first baseman. And that was because he was too lazy to run to the bag. The pitcher side uh, was a Jack LeMay. He said, yeah, you, your legs out because he'd never run first base over there. But, but I did find out something about his childhood. And what's interesting is that he had a good relationship with his parents, from what I understand. His parents were pretty good people. And his brother has been married for over 60 years. His brother seemed to be an extremely well-adjusted person. Uh, Dick was an outlier. You know, he had that, that big ego. And, mm -hmm. and when he was married, he made a joke about his marital problems. You know, he said his wife threw a bowling ball at him and broke the window. And he said, oh, that was a $500 window, you know. Uh, he, he joked about his relationships. I don't think he was capable of having a good relationship. And I said, well, I found it interesting that his brother, who grew up in the same family, and his parents apparently had a very good marriage. His brother was a well-adjusted person. And, and Dick, you know, sometimes you get an outlier. I think, I think he was. Thanks. Yeah. Anybody else got any questions? Just there's a small enough group here, 30 some people, just unmute yourself and and ask away. Uh, hello, Bill. Yeah, you you just posted something. Why don't you? Uh, well, why don't you say what you're? Yeah, it's, I was that you, you encouraged us to talk. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It was. Uh, I I remember hearing a story once about Earl Wilson completing a shutout, and on the final out, he allegedly fielded a ground ball and ran over to first to touch the bag rather than take a chance tossing it to Stewart. Um, is that true? Is that in the book? Or <laughs> no, it, it's not. I, don't, I, I didn't come across that. I don't know if it is, but Earl Wilson had a history with yeah. Stewart, and the Stewart botched a couple <clears throat> of games. It was one that was a pop-up that went up, and it was near Stewart, but Stewart just stood there, didn't go near it. And Wilson and Ed Bursu and Wilson decided they had to run for it at the last minute as Stewart stood by. They smashed into each other. Stuart Wilson got hurt, had to leave the game. Oh. And it was, it was oh. a huge error and turned the game around. That was when they were challenging the Yankees for first. And about a week later, it happened again. Wilson was pitching and Stewart botched it again. And and they went to him and Wilson was just furious. And then like a week later, he said, well, it could have happened to anybody. You know, he, he got, a, got control of himself and said, you know, it's, it's if, you know, Bursu or Malzone committed the error, nobody would have said anything, but because it's Dick. Everybody's on him, but he, so Wilson had a, a history with Stewart, and if he did run to first base, he was well justified. <laughs> I have a comment. Go. Okay, thank you. Um, 
I think uh, the most recent Red Sox, who unfortunately gets compared to Dick Stewart, or got compared to Dick Stewart, was Billy Buckner. Yet, uh, for the for obviously for the error that he made in the World Series, um, but obviously they were the di diametrically opposite in personalities, if I'm not mistaken. Billy Buckner, family man, achieved a lot as a regular ball player. Um, so in a way, that comparison to Stewart is 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 very one dimensional and very narrow. Well, I think totally unfair uh, too. Buckner's known for one incident. Stewart has gets a lifetime achievement award when it comes to bungling at first base. Uh, <laughs> yeah, they're very different. You know, Stewart made errors. He didn't. He if he was in that situation. In fact, there was a play in the in that seventh game of the 1960 World Series, right in the ninth inning, when Rocky Nelson. Caught a ground ball, stuck on first base. Mantle ducked back in, and that enabled him to tie the game. I asked a couple of players, said, "What if Dick had been there?" And he said, "I, I think that ball would have been in the right field. The series would have been over." You know, so so Dick inadvertently, by not being in, may have saved the World Series for the uh, the Pirates. That's another. another See, uh, Tony, you've got your hand raised there. Yeah, I, I just wanted to show off my Dick Stewart autographed Little League glove. <laughs> oh, <okay. laughs> Let me tell you, I used it with the same level of skill that Dick did. <laughs> Norm? I said Dick Raddatz said um, Dick Raddatz. I was going to say that I saw Stuart play I several said, times when he was on the Mets. They got a license and, plate for him called E3. And I said, I remember seeing Stuart play several times when he was on the Mets. And I guess my, my opinion was a little different. I was actually, I heard so much about fielding and he actually, I thought did pretty well at, at fielding at first. The thing that was horrible was pop-ups. I mean, there, there, was no, there was, I never saw him catch a, a pop-up and the whole time, I, whenever I went, there were balls that were dropped 10 feet away from him, but he never even went for them. But, you know, throws and everything, he seemed fine. I guess I must be senile. <laughs> Bill, there's a question in the chat as to whether there's any current player that reminds you of Dick Stewart in any way. It's a question from Alex. Oh, God. you know, I, I'm, I'm hard pressed because I don't know as much about current baseball as I do about history. I yeah. would say there, are, if there, somebody is that bad a fielder, they're probably DH, so they're not out there fielding. Mm. Uh, there are a lot of think... egotistical players out there. Uh, you know, and there are an awful lot of players who strike out a lot. So I, I, I couldn't pick any one person who's like Dick Stewart. I'm trying to think back maybe, you know, in that last 10, 20 years, and no one comes to mind. I immediately thought of Dave Kingman. Uh, in, in some ways, yes. In some ways, yes. That's, that's not a bad comparison at all. He wasn't as bad a fielder as Stewart, and he wasn't – Stewart was jocular. Kingman was abrasive. Right. Um, yeah, the media, bad, loved, the media loved Stewart. I mean, and they, they hated Kingman, but the, right. all the reporters loved Stewart because he was good for a quote. He was always good for some funny comment. Yeah. Bill, do you think that, um, speaking of DH, that Dick would have been a good DH? I mean, obviously he could hit if he didn't have to worry about the fielding, whether or not he cared about it. Maybe his managers wouldn't have been as frustrated. Um, you know, do you think he was a DH uh, 10 years before his time? I think he would have been a better DH. And I think the managers would have played him more because he, if you look at his statistics until 61, he never played regularly. Uh, the managers never played him every day. He platooned with uh, Ted Kulczewski, Rocky Nelson. Uh, so I think he would have played a lot more and probably been a lot, done a lot better. I mean, he did, you know, 20 some odd home runs thing, 100. 18 games. I mean, he could have hit 40 home runs. The year he hit 35, uh, he hit. He had a lot fewer games than all the other leaders in the league. I mean, he was because he didn't start playing regularly until May. I think it would have been it would have been much better for him as a DH. I saw I saw something come up across the chat screen. Did you interview Frank Thomas? I did not. Um, and I wrote some things about Frank Thomas that were somewhat harsh because Frank Thomas was a very controversial character and very disliked by a lot of people. Uh, my, my Frank Thomas stories, I interviewed him at length for a book on the Mets and wrote, I thought, kind of nice things about him. And he is the only player who's ever complained about anything I wrote about him. Uh, he sent me this long, long handwritten letter. He was upset because I didn't put a picture of him in the book. He said he hit 34 home runs and he thought he should have gotten a picture. 
And then he complained because there was something about him being a bad fielder. And actually, I didn't say he was a bad fielder. I quoted somebody else saying he's a bad <laughs> fielder. And he was. But uh, you talk to any, I, Vern Law had, he, Thomas was an agitator. And of course, that famed incident with infamous infinite incident with Richie Allen in, the, in Philadelphia. But, and it was right in character. I wrote quite a bit about that because Stewart wasn't, you know, was there at the time. So, um, you know, it was Tom, I did not interview Thomas intentionally. Um, I'm not sure, I, I'd interviewed him before about his Mets days, but not for this one. It seemed that a lot of his teammates might have disliked him, but one point you made early in the book, you said that they actually came to like him and you said he was so outlandish that no one took him seriously. That, that's right. I mean, that, that came around once they got to know him a little bit. When he first came up, you can just imagine him. Here he is a rookie sitting in the clubhouse, regaling reporters about how great he is. You know, the other players would walk by him and just make comments constantly like, you know, once you do something before you start mouthing off and uh, maybe you should, maybe you should learn how to field and, uh, and, and he would just shout, you know, shout back at them. And, and they just couldn't believe that a, a rookie was doing those kinds of things. But that's that was Dick. Any stories about his relationship with, um, especially with the Pirates, having, you know, strong um, African-American, Latino um, presence on the team? Or, um, was, was, did he get along uh, equally obnoxiously or well with teammates of all backgrounds? He, you know, it's an interesting question. And he did not really interact with anyone. I mean, he did not have close friends on the Pirates. Uh, he was not friends with Clemente, but he wasn't friends with Grote, Burton, Vern Law, anybody. Uh, he just went his own way. Um, whether he was out looking for women, you know, he, he was out late. You know, Vern Law told me a story about how he got annoyed because Stewart would get in at, you know, eight o'clock in the morning after a night on the town and not play very well the next day. Uh, he, he didn't. What, what I found interesting was getting along with managers, and what really I came up, I came the conclusion I came to was that Danny Murtaugh was really the best manager for him, and I've written a fair amount about Murtaugh, who I thought was an interesting guy, uh, because he was very even tempered, and players in Bregan was the opposite, and when when Murtaugh took over for Bregan, it was like a breath of fresh air for the Pirates. They had these young players, and Bregan was all over them. He got them so tense they couldn't play. And Murtaugh was the kind of guy who was much more supportive, much better. And he would joke about Stewart. I mean, it was Stewart, after Stewart had his first year in Boston, they were talking to Murtaugh and, and about how, how uh, horrible he was in the field. And Murtaugh you know, said, what? You mean he didn't feel well over there? And just sarcastically. And uh, he, he always had something funny to say about Stewart. Uh, he just took him with a grain of salt. And I think he... And he he would let him get so far and then he cracked down on him, but he found him entertaining. And I think Murtaugh was that kind of guy. The players really like Murtaugh. I mean, everybody says good things about him. And, and the other extreme who Stewart played for in Philadelphia was Gene Mock. Uh, Gene Mock thought he was friends with Stewart from way back in California, but he thought he could get along with him. He said, I can handle Stewart. He got Stewart and Bobolinski the same year and Wes Covington. I mean, it was just... <laughs> Uh, and Mock, the reporters just had a field day with, you know, how, what's going to happen in Philadelphia. And afterwards, Mock, and Mock said, that was a big mistake. Shouldn't have brought those guys in. I have another question. Did he ever show up for any of his team's old-timers games or old-timer days? Yes, he did. He showed up for a number of Pittsburgh ones, and he played the role. You know, somebody hit a pop-up over there, and he'd let it drop, or he'd let the ball go through his legs. And... Um, <laughs> There was one time where he did not show up in Pittsburgh, uh, and he said that they wouldn't. Uh, it needed a first-class ticket because he was so tall. They had to fly him in first class, and they wouldn't. And what the PR person for the Pirates said was that um, he had wanted a first-class ticket, and he planned to cash it in, and then buy a coach ticket and keep the difference. And uh, he uh, he he was only, he may well have been short of money at that point. So he didn't make it, but he showed up. He showed up on, and he went to, he lived around New York, I think the Long Island area. And uh, he would show up at Shea Stadium once in a while. And uh, he always, he did card shows eventually. First he didn't do card shows, then he did, but he was known for uh, ducking out in the middle, 
going out for a smoke. And there's one story about somebody mentioned it last time when I was talking to Rhode Island and said he was at um, a dinner. Hawk Harrelson was the MC and he went to introduce Stewart and his seat was empty. And he said, well, Dick's pictures uh, often wondered where Dick was often, often wondered where Dick was. And he, um, he just left. Uh, and I heard other people say the same thing. He just said, I'm going off for smoke, take off, never come back. Thank you. Brian, you had a question in the chat. I, maybe you want to explain it. You just muted yourself. <laughs> You go. We'll, we'll try again. Okay. Uh, Bill, uh, thanks. First of all, thanks for the book. It arrived today. Um, oh, really I appreciate it. And uh, so the question is, uh, generally, are Sabre metrics accurate with fielding? I mean, I, I, it's, it's hard for me to understand how they can be as accurate as all the anecdotal evidence that we all accumulate over the years. I'm not a I'm not a stats guy, and I tend to be somewhat skeptical of fielding and think there's something there, but you have to watch the players play. Um, that's what Red Sox fans always like to say. Derek Jeter was the worst shortstop in the history of baseball, and the numbers prove it. Yeah, you know, I'm a Yankee fan. I watched Jeter play a lot, and his last few years he had very limited range, but in his prime, I thought he was a very good defensive shortstop. And what struck me about some of the the saber the numbers that I've seen is the variation from year to year, where you see somebody having a, you know, a really bad year and then a really good year. I don't think fielding is gonna vary that much. I think his circumstances, you know, what kind of team you're playing on, I know they factor in a lot of those things and I don't know enough about it to say yes or no. Uh, I think there are some players who were thought to be really good fielders who are probably not. But uh, you know, Dick Grote, for example, Dick Grote was thought to be somewhat mediocre shortstop. He didn't have a lot of talent. But uh, the numbers show he was pretty good, and he was thought to be pretty good in his day. Maybe Andy will have something to say about this next month. Yeah, Andy, Andy would be much better, much better person than I to talk about statistics because I'm I'm not your guy. Do you follow <laughs> fielding stats at all, Andy? Yeah, real briefly. Uh, technology has changed everything. The old version of Dick Stewart's time to measure fielding is, is really hard because, you know, the things that are consistent, just like Bill said, Bill R said, is that, you know, there is skill and talent innate in fielding and trying to measure that is really, really hard. You know, like things like reaction time, things like the ability to feel well and the the technology is much better today to measure all those things. So we have much better measurements of fielding today just because of tech where, you know, maybe scouts had a, it was tilted a little more towards scouting and observational opinion. There's not a whole lot of stuff you can do with, uh, with fielding ability in the 1950s and 60s. Yeah. One thing Dick did was he led this league first baseman in errors his first, I think, six or seven or eight years. And it was somewhat of a feat because he was platoon in a lot of those years. In fact, his first year, he didn't come up until the All-Star break and still managed to lead the first baseman in errors. And sometimes he led by a large margin. And in 1962, he tied with Marv Throneberry for the most errors. And neither one of them played much more than 100 games, if that. So, they, uh, yeah, he... I'd, uh, it, statistics aside, I'd put my money on him as being right down there at the bottom of the list. I would say that Stewart failed the statistical test and the eyeball test at the same time. <laughs> <laughs> and the, the effort, effort test. test. The, the steps, well, yeah. yeah. Uh, the effort. My question point. actually has to do with, with uh, Stewart's character. Okay. Um, I'm thinking... Picky Higgins was the DM that made the trade to acquire him, or yeah, I mean Dick O'Connell, right? So it was Higgins that went out to get him. The Red Correct. Sox at that time had a well-deserved yes. reputation for being a bit of a country club, guys who burned the candle at both ends and maybe didn't take the game as seriously as they should. 
Who would think adding Dick Stewart to that mix was a good idea? Well, I don't know that Pinky Higgins had a lot of good ideas. Um, well, but that in that year, sense. 63 was a year when they sort of turned it around and Chuck Schilling was there and Yastrzemski was there and they were young guys and they were, you know, had sort of the college spirit. And uh, I know they, Yastrzemski wrote in his Al Hirschberg book that they were looked down upon because nobody else was enthusiastic. Uh, and Pesky tried to get them fired up. You know, he was a real uh, hot, you know, hot tempered manager at the time. And he tried to get more spirit in there, but uh, well, getting Stewart wasn't so much for the, the chemistry is for a right-handed bat uh, in Fenway park, because in those days they were, you know, supposedly built for Fenway, but they didn't have any right-hand power hitters. I mean, Frank Malzone was the only one who could be considered a power hitter and he really wasn't any, a big masher. So that's the reason they got Stewart. And Stewart was available. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, he had a bad season in, in uh, Pittsburgh, and Don Clendenin was coming along, and we need a right-hand hitter. Here's a guy who was an all-star last year. Let's go get him. Wasn't that the year that uh, Mantilla came to the Red Sox? Yes, it was. And he was, he was a righty hit, and he had some power. Yeah, they, certainly when they oh, got him, they didn't, think, <laughs> they didn't think he was a power hitter. He didn't have a reputation as being, you know, he only hit, I think, 11 home runs with the Mets the last year. So, you know, he was a surprise power hitter. They didn't get him for that. Bill, I, I remember when I was, uh, I was working on a book and I'm too young to remember the team, but I was surprised at just how good the Sox were in the first half of 63, really competing for the lead. Um, in studying Stewart's season that year, um, and you talk about them tanking or not tanking, but falling apart in August, were the calmness and the fans and other folks, I assume Pesky was, really, you know, critical of Stewart's somewhat, you know, seemingly lackadaisical approach when the team fell, you know, from these lofty heights in the last month or two of the season? Actually, Stewart was one of, about the only guy who was hitting. Uh, the team fell apart, and he was the only one who was really, he, you know, he, stayed, he ended up leading the league in the RBIs. And uh, so they were critical of the team. They were terribly critical of the team, but not necessarily of him because he was doing well. One, when, when I'm talking about RBIs, there was a story in the end of the next year, 64, he had a shot at getting the RBI title. I think Brooks Robinson won it. And he was four behind the last game. The bases were loaded. Mantilla was at third. And the pitcher threw a wild pitch. And Stewart was yelling at Mantilla to get back to third. Mantilla <laughs> was coming in and he practically blocked him off home plate. Because and, and afterwards he said, that was my run. I need that run. We're not going to, you know, we're out of it. We're not going to win the pennant. I need those RBIs. I, I was going to tell the coach to hold him if there was a wild pitch. And that was that. He was worried about his RBI title. You know, anyone else <laughs> might have thought it, but wouldn't say it. <laughs> Was he, was he as clutch with the 60 Pirates? Was he great down the stretch in 60 as well? He didn't play. I mean, Rocky Nelson played a lot. He, he was not one of the stars in the Pirates. I mean, Clemente really was, you know, sort of powering that team. Um, Stewart was a supporting character. He led the team in home runs, but the Pirates were always, a, you know, not a power hitting team because of Forbes Field. Always had very few home runs. Grote, of course, with the MVP, Clemente, and those were the real stars. And he did poorly in the and World course, Series, you said. He was three for 20. He didn't feel that well, didn't drive in any runs. And it was a, a terrible disappointment for him. And here's a guy with a huge ego on the on the stage. And, you know, in those days, it, you know, it strikes you how big the World Series was back then. You know, everything stopped. You know, uh, Pittsburgh courts closed in the afternoon mm -hmm. that, that year when they were having the series. You know, now it's just, you know, if you're a baseball fan, you're interested, but in those days, the, the whole country, you know, stopped. There was no Super Bowl. Uh, you know, the fun, there was no March Madness, none of that. It was all the World Series. And here he was on the world stage and biggest stage and just fell on his face. I've got one more question. Was he remembered by baseball or by his teammates when he passed away? As today, when players pass away, uh, regardless of their, you know, status, um, there's noteworthy event, there's noteworthy, you know, media coverage or, you know, did, did people show up for his funeral? Was there any 
fanfare that Dick Stewart had passed away? No, I don't think there really was. He he was out in Redwood City, which is where he started, which is where he was born. And there was very little mention. I, I doubt that any, I don't know if there was a funeral. You know, I said he didn't have much family around at that point, And there was certainly mm -hmm. not, not much publicity. Uh, the obits were all the places he, he played. And what was interesting to me is that the place that they remembered him the best was Pittsburgh. Uh, he played there the longest, of course, but mm -hmm. you, you know, track the old Boston papers, you know, in the 70s and 80s, and not a lot, but Pittsburgh always kept track of him. He was always considered one of the pirates and he went back, he'd go back to the Dapper Dan dinner. Uh, he was always much more popular in Pittsburgh than he was in any other city he played in. But well, the uh, team death, won. I don't think really... I mean, the team won. Yeah, if that's... he was on the 67 yeah. Sox, I think he'd that, be That's him. right. Yeah. That's yeah. right. And what, what really struck me about that book was that in 1958, when they finished second, what a big deal it was. You know, now if you don't make the postseason, you're nothing. Uh, but they had been last almost every year and then had the horrible teams. They called them the, you know, the Ricky Dinks. And uh, to come in second, they had a parade and the, the fans were just wild. They were going to Forbes Field, you know, to get 30,000 for many games, which is a huge crowd in those days. Uh, it was just such a big deal to finish second or finish, you know, in the first division. You know, if you were fourth or better, that was a that was a successful season. I apologize if you mentioned it earlier and I, I had bad reception a little bit. I heard about the, the brother who was shown the book and, and recognized it, but, or maybe it was his brother-in-law, but does he, did he have any children that he maintained or maybe later in his later years reconciled with and had a good relationship with? I don't believe so. Um, I had a daughter who he saw sometimes and it turned, his brother had a much better relationship with Dick's daughter than Dick did. And she died. The daughter had passed away from the first marriage. Uh, the two sons, he did not have good relationships with. I tried to contact both of them, got nothing. Um, and uh, it, the story, I think it was Bob Friend told me, he said, we're, we're in New York, we're playing, I guess must have been the Mets at the time. And he said, um, yeah, we're in the hotel and there's a crib out in the hallway of the hotel. It's Dick's son. Dick didn't want him in the room because he, it would disturb his sleep. And so he said, we see this, this kid out in the crib in the, in the hallway. So you know, you're, when, when you're doing that, you know, you're probably not going to have a great relationship with your kids. as they get. And then you know, he ended up being divorced twice from the mother. The story he told about the second marriage, he told Bob Oldis this. He said he'd been divorced. He's on the beach somewhere. And he's walking down the beach and said, boy, there's a really good looking woman. Sees her from behind, goes up to her, turns around. It's his ex-wife. That's how they met. Uh, they end up getting married a second time and didn't last a second time. Wow. Wow. So I have a question. Um, he, his, his, uh, he had pretty strong years I mean, for being a one dimensional player. He still had home runs and, and RBIs his last two seasons with uh, Boston and then with Philadelphia. And then the following year, 66, he really just, you know, fell off the edge there. He had a very limited year with two teams. Uh, his, his career ended rather suddenly. Was it just a matter of him getting old that quick or, or what happened there? I, I don't know. You know. He got hurt with the Mets. He had a, a strained rib cage muscle, which is the first time he'd been injured. He never was had any serious injuries before that. You know, he was old. He was 30. 33 at that point in those days you know players didn't last they didn't do the type of conditioning they do now so 33 was considered old and then you know at 65 I, I looked at the 65 Phillies and said you know all right how many players do they have over a certain age and they were like I think two had I think had Gus Triandos and West Covington and they were just out to you know they, there weren't a lot of 38 39 year olds playing baseball if they were they were knuckleball pitchers you know there weren't a lot of first baseman and people like Stan Musial around. It was, uh, they were out. So mid thirties was kind of end of the line for most of these guys. And he was, he was older. He just didn't, couldn't get around with the ball anymore. Dixie. Uh, Bill, uh, behind the scenes stuff, how long did it take you to put the book together and how long did it take you to convince the publisher this was a good idea? <laughs> um, you know, I don't really know because I work on several things that, you know, in bits and pieces here and there. I'd say a couple of years. It wasn't that long. 
you know, my first book took 11 years to research and write, and I've gotten a lot faster, partly because there's so much available online. And, you know, I've, I've done every book except one with McFarland, and it didn't take long to convince them. I mean, Stuart's a, it's kind of, their, they're right up yeah. there in their wheelhouse. So I, and I said, you know, I'm doing this book. Do you want to see it? And they said, yes. And said, do you want to do it? And they said, yes. And, you know, it was, it was fairly, fairly quick. I, you said you know, that it, you... It, you said that you talked to Vern Lahr and Bob Friend. I thought that those guys died a little bit ago. That's why I was wondering how long that you were writing. The book. <laughs> well, Friend, you now Friend died. I, Friend died within maybe three or four months after I talked to him. Uh, Verdon passed away. I don't know a year after I talked to him. Uh, Paul Pettit as well. Um, <sighs> so I mean that day. I mean they're all pushing ninety. And yeah. I was surprised how you know who was really in great shape is Dick Grove. Dick, when I talked to him, was 89, I think. Could be 89. And, and, and it, I think it was 89. And uh, he was still, still working. I mean, in fact, I called him to see you know, I wanted to get an address, send him a copy of the book after it was out. He's still working. They said, you know, he ran down to the bank to make a deposit. He'll be back in a few minutes. Uh, huh. And very, very alert, very interesting, very sharp, very opinionated. Uh, just a great interview. Law the same way. Law is a very conservative guy uh he's into a lot of conservative causes an interesting guy to talk to and a talker i mean he 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 talked a lot Grove was more of a conversationalist Vern was Vern was a talker and he had a lot to say about japan he coached in japan so he gave me a lot of background on how japanese the japanese train and what it's like over there so that he was very interesting as well We've gone a full hour now, pretty much. I, I see maybe one person left, which is pretty good. Uh, good retention rate, Bill. Um, the, uh, I thought you, mean, you mean one person has departed, not we have one person left, right? <laughs> yeah, oh, yes, that's correct. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I do have one question um, to uh, interject into here. Um, Saul and I had been talking earlier on about a certain question that we would like to ask all of the presenters as they come through. And so Saul, I want you to come back on uh, with that question that we're going to be asking every, uh, every person that we have present on our chapter Zoom meetings. So take it away, Saul. All right, well, thanks, thanks Joanne. And, and thanks Bill uh, R for a great talk, a great hour. Yeah. Um, I, uh, yeah, the, the question I'd like to ask is actually, it's, it's a, a new tradition we're starting tonight and a a shameless ripoff from the uh, Rob Nye or Saber podcast, but uh, we thought it'd be neat to ask, and I think we'll do it at the beginning from now on. Um, well, I don't know. I, I think we want to know. Oh, you like, like it at the end? All right, whatever. That keep people you know? on. Yeah, yeah, yeah let, that's a good yeah, idea. Let them, let them uh, do the whole and they, thing. Then they won't the depart. Okay. Yeah, so, that's right. <laughs> um, yeah. All right. So, so, and actually, I'm. I, you you gave us a little hint early on, and I'm thinking, oh, now now I know why you did a book on Dick Stewart, but. Yeah. Um, why don't yeah. you, uh, the question um, is, uh, what is your earliest baseball memory? Well, my earliest baseball memory is being in the second grade and a teacher turning on the radio of game seven of the 1960 World Series. And then telling us to our homework was to listen to the game and report what the final score was. Uh, my parents weren't baseball fans. You know, as I was seven, I knew nothing about baseball. They weren't sports fans. And it was another oh, year and a half before I had any other contact with baseball. I, I, I knew that the Pirates won, didn't know what it meant, didn't really have any interest in either team. But it wasn't until the spring of 1962 that I got interest in baseball. And that's the first season I ever, I ever watched. But the first memory was a very fragmentary one. And uh, it did not spark a lifelong interest in baseball. It took another year and a half. But it is kind of cool. You and, wrote about that team and that game. Yeah. Actually, well, you, from both you, you, sides, right? You wrote a book, or you both? No, you never yeah, wrote a book on the book. Yankees. Yeah. Well, in the Yankee book, I covered game seven in great detail. And it was one of the most interesting games, as you know, all of you who are historians know, it was one of the great games. I, I wrote about that. And the game seven of the 1962 World Series, Ralph Terry being the loser in the first and the goat and being the hero of the second. So it was an interesting mm -hmm. contrast. But yeah, I hadn't thought about that, the fact that I ended up writing about that, and that was my first memory. So I'm glad you asked the question. <laughs> Well, thank you for, for sharing. Yeah. And I'm starting our new tradition, which yeah. of course we've shamelessly stolen. 
(laughs) (laughs) Well, I I think that went very well in the end because it really kind of told us a lot about Bill Rysick, who he is and, uh, and, and the interest, how it came full circle. I think that's really good. I think it's really great the way that that worked out. So, yeah. Who knows? Maybe next time. Well, you know, when Andy comes on, which uh, I will mention that everybody mark your calendars and it is February 3rd, which is the first Thursday in February. And Andy Andres will be on and he's going to teach us everything that we need to know about stats in baseball. And um, and I do appreciate everything that he does in that regard because i remember one meeting that we had at the baseball tavern many years ago back when we were meeting there where he did tell us all about war okay and ever since then he put up that equation you know war equals blah blah blah, and all this and i've always thought it would be a great thing to put onto a t-shirt war and then that equation what is it good for (laughs) oh my god that's awesome yeah oh Yeah. yeah Yeah, That's a great I idea, that would be Really good, you know. So right in the back of the shirt and everything. So uh, I still have that in the back of my mind, and it's all because of his presentation, which was really, really impressive, and I learned a lot on it. And I'm still thinking about putting it on a T-shirt. Okay, why don't we make that the Saber Boston shirt? Or what is it good <laughs> yeah. for? And we could use like Yaz's War from '67, which I think is one of the highest wars in history. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah, well, yeah, we can put that on there or you can pencil in your, your own, you know, yeah, favorite, favorite ones. And yeah, but I do, I, I, I just always like the way that the equation looked and, and then just the way, yeah, and what is it good for? And some people may say absolutely nothing. Mm. <laughs> That's awesome. Yeah, so let's keep that in mind. We'll work on that. The baseball one. Just put yeah. a baseball one. Yeah. Dick Stewart, by the way. Dick Stewart had 9.7 war for his entire 10-year career. Brother. Wow. <laughs> for a guy with all those RBIs and home runs, that's that's kind of scary. Yeah. Um, Dixie, you were going to uh, say Joanne, something? Joanne? Yes. I was going to say, is, um, is the first Thursday of the month going to be the likely uh, schedule for yes. this? For, for this group? Well, yes, this will be the next one. Now, uh, we are going, uh, we're trying to adhere to the first Thursday, but sometimes things happen where we would have to move it. And your best bet is to also keep an eye on the Sabre um, events calendar. Uh, Not only are we listed on there, but also uh, many other exciting things are also listed on the Sabre calendar. Uh, So one way or the other, you'll uh, find out about it either by uh, a Sabre email or just by watching the calendar. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Speak. Dixie's got a question. Bill, for 25 years, I've been listening to people call you by various names. What is the correct pronunciation of your last name? It is Rysak. Well, that's I, I shouldn't say the correct. That is the pronunciation I use. Yeah. It's Rysak. The, the, that's not, that's not the, the correct Polish one, but we no, anglicized it. <laughs> no, I'm, 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 half, I'm half Polish, so I know it's not. <laughs> yeah and, and there there are people in my family and my, my father pronounced it differently than me my mother pronounced it the same way as i my sister pronounced it differently and we we each have my i'm i'm right we each have our own name i'm i'm, I'm rising <laughs> <laughs> and i thought it was czechoslovakian and it was right check but you know what was i don't know you know uh, the, the polish pronunciation is dixie can tell you is right check but oh you know, excellent people are, yeah, people aren't going to get that in the United States, so we just we we, we go along. The bill part is pretty easy, though. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> Some, sometimes you got those stray Z's in there, you know it's Polish. <laughs> yeah. I wonder if I might just mention one thing. I, I looked at the calendar here, and I believe uh, Joanne, you said the meeting uh, next meeting would be February third at eight o'clock. For yeah. February 3rd. I noticed that uh, that's the night of Sabre has programming. Oh, I, uh, I thought it was the 10th. I yeah. thought we moved the March meeting to the 10th. Oh, did we, move it? did we move it? Oh, okay. All right. I haven't seen it You're written up yet. Yeah. I, I just had down the arbitrary one. <laughs> okay. Uh-huh. Did we move it to the 10th? Okay. 
Let me move it to the 10. There you go. Okay. But um, as long as Andy can make it. Yeah as, yeah, as long as Andy can make it. So uh, it'll be contingent on his availability. <laughs> I'm, I'm only available on the third, so find someone else. Oh, I'm done! I'm kidding, I'm kidding, I'm kidding. <laughs> Actually, February 10th might be pretty close to the beginning of spring training, God willing. Yeah. Uh, yes, I know. What? What's that? Yeah. I know. Let's hope they yeah, can what... come to their senses by then. And not, yeah, you know... What... Yeah. What about truck day, huh? Are they even talking to each other yet? No. I don't know. No. No. And Rob Rob Manford's like doing great things like, you know, getting rid of Ken Rosenthal. So yeah. that's quite a column Chad Finn had in the Globe the other day. Yeah. Ouch. Yeah. Uh, I don't know if anyone saw this because the news just broke, but the athletic was purchased by the New York Times company today. Wow. I had heard those rumors. Huh? Wow. Oh. $550 million in cash. So Ken Rosenthal smiling today. Oh. I, uh, I uh, called up Major League Baseball in Manhattan about a month ago asking about purchasing a World Series program. And the fellow said, I cannot talk about that because everything is in limbo. Oh, wow. I thought that was very interesting. I said, well, how about an all-star program? <laughs> yep, can't, cannot sell you one, cannot talk about it. Hmm. Here's a good idea for baseball. We can't talk about it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> what is it good for? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Unbelievable. Uh, does, yeah. does, does the price of the athletic mean the New York Times is not a failing newspaper? <laughs> yeah, I think it's I think it's I think one of the right. few. Yeah. <laughs> I think you're right. <laughs> well, you know, it's nice to have something to laugh about these days. So thank you. <laughs> Dick Stewart was a great elixir for that, oh, was. our Absolutely. current state of affairs. So that's great. <laughs> well, thank you. Thank you very much for having me on. I always enjoyed doing this and uh it was a great to meet some of you I haven't met before. So thank you, Joanne. Yeah. 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 Okay. Dick yeah. Stewart's fielding something Democrats and Republicans can agree on. <laughs> <laughs> I'll turn, off the, I'll turn right. off the recording now. Just oh, uh, good. So we can talk politics. Okay. Now we can.